All right, how's it going everybody? So the other day I got a younger friend who asked me like, hey, how can I start investing? I'm no expert, but I've tried a few stuff. So in this video, I'll share with you what I have done and the transparent outcome for everything that I did. But first, a disclaimer, this is not financial advice. I am just some guy on the internet sharing what I've done, all right? So if you need financial advice, please consult a real professional. Now we got that out of the way. Now let's start with why should you invest? And for me, I got three reasons. The first one is having money equals freedom. I know it sounds kind of materialistic, but if you really think about it, if you have money, you, you have more freedom, you can do whatever you want. If anything happens to you, most problems can be solved with money, most of them. Not everything, but most. And to me, that is freedom. Reason number two, the end goal for a lot of people, they don't want to work until they die. I don't think our retirement pension will be sufficient for our retirement. And the last reason, reason number three, I can't rely solely on my salary because I don't think it's enough. These three reasons are the reasons that I want to invest. The first one, is it risky? And the second one is liquidity. And the third one is, what's the strategy? Capital appreciation or dividend? All right, so those are the jargons. So now I'm gonna explain it to you in plain English, all right? All right, so the first one is, is it risky? Something that is risky is, for example, stocks. And something that is not so risky, like fixed deposit or ASNB. So far, nobody has ever really lost money in ASNB. Or or fixed deposit so that's why it's low risk but the potential for you to make a lot of money is also not that high however for stocks I think one of the reasons a lot of people like it so much is because it might increase in a lot of value in the future so that's an example of something risky and not risky the second thing that I look for is liquidity what that means is if I invest my money into something is it easy for me to get the money out anytime I want for example, you have unit trusts or robo advisors where you invest money and everybody says, oh, you it's actually a long-term game, three to five years that you have to be consistent and give it some time to mature, and that, which is true. I mean, that's the original plan, but in reality, there's always something going, coming up in our lives. Maybe somewhere down the line, something happens. Oh, I need to renovate my house. Oh, I need to buy a new car. Oh, maybe you're getting married or whatever. Maybe you want to withdraw some of that money to cover whatever it is that you want to buy. So if something is not liquid, it's very hard to get that money out. So if something is liquid, it's easy to get that money out for you to use. So I'll give you an example. Stocks is very liquid. It's easy for you to buy and it's easy for you to sell. Uh, something that is not liquid at all, in my opinion, is like property. Let's say I have a property right now and I'm like, I need a lot of money, like right now. Then I gotta go find an agent. I gotta assign him to go find somebody, viewing and all that kind of stuff. It maybe will take maybe six months or maybe up to a year for me to get that money. Totally not recommended. Okay, so the, the last one is the strategy, capital appreciation or dividend. So capital appreciation uh, is the classic buy and sell, meaning you buy something at this price and then just hope that in the future the value goes up and you sell it up here so that difference is your profit. So that's the classic capital appreciation. And then the second strategy is dividend. So dividend strategy to me is if you own something and then throughout your ownership, that thing will pay you some sort of money throughout your ownership. So a good example is a successful business. So if you have a nice cafe or something like that. So every month the, the cafe is making money for you if you run it right. And another example for dividend uh, investing is dividend stocks. Every quarter of the year, the company would announce, oh, we're, we're paying out this much dividend bonus to our investors. I'm a huge fan of uh, dividend stocks, but we, we will cover in the next section. All right. So let's start with the first thing that I've tried. Um, ASNB, Amana Saham National Burhai. So what is it actually? It's basically a unit trust. So how it works is they pool money from all the investors and then there will be fund managers to figure out what to do with all this money. And at the end of the year, they would redistribute some of that profit back to their shareholders. And that's how it works. The pros to ASNB is that you can invest online and through their app. However, to withdraw your money, you still need to go to the bank physically and fill out a form during office hour. It's like 2021 and we still have to do this. That's it's just terrible. Okay, so the ASNB pros, is it transparent? They gave out an annual booklet report of their performance. If I read this book, I just fall asleep. It's just, this is our report. Read our really thick report thingy here. And what am I gonna get out of this? So usually when I get the report, I just toss it away. I, I it just, it means nothing to me. So the ASNB cons for this is that you actually have to wait a year for them to mail you this report. So in between that one year, you don't know what's happening with your money. The last point, 
the ASNB Pros for accessibility, the original intent is to help out the Bumiputras in Malaysia. So that is a pros to the Bumiputra, but the cons is it's segregating Malaysia by race. So that is the cons in my opinion. So the next investment that I tried is a Maybank Gold investment account. The logic behind gold as an investment is number one, there's a limited amount of gold that exists in the world. The demand for gold theoretically will go up as the population also goes up. When there's a limited supply, the demand goes up by that logic. If you own some gold, the price should go up and therefore you should make a profit. I don't want to deal with the physical storage of gold. So an alternative to this is a gold investment account where you buy and sell gold theoretically. Maybank has a gold investment account, so I opened an account with them. So they gave you this book, like a very old school before internet banking exists. I don't have the book with me anymore because I threw it out, but you can visit their website to see how much are they selling for gold and how much they're buying back that gold. So in 2011, I bought around 15,000 ringgit worth of gold. And then the value actually went down a little bit. And then it was really slow to move in either direction for many years. Every month when I check the price, it just doesn't move in. And I'm like, man, this is so boring. So after four years or so, I decided to close my account. And then I took that money out and then I did something else with it. So gold investment account. The pros, the risk is pretty low. The cons, it's... <laughs> It's incredibly boring. Maybe if you're younger, you like something a little more exciting. Maybe gold is not for you. But if you like to collect physical gold, then that's a whole nother story. All right, logistics. If you buy gold, if you love collecting gold, you have to deal with the logistics of where you're gonna store all your gold, right? So if you have an in gold investment account, that eliminates that problem because you just buy and sell gold theoretically. All right, next, stock investing. I'm not an expert in this. Unpopular opinion, I don't think anybody really knows if any stock goes up or down. I mean, they can predict and some people might claim that they know, in which case I think they're either trying to sell you some sort of course or they're trying to get some sort of followers online or they're just full of, yeah. That's my personal opinion. From my observation, you can be two types of stock investor. So the first one is the active trader. These are the guys who buy and sell, make a profit from the difference, okay? And uh, the second one is passive. So the passive guys, they buy a stock that pays dividend. So in my opinion, these guys who buy stocks that pay dividend, they don't really have an intention to sell the stock in the near future because they want to hold on to that stock as long as possible because it just pays the money every month. It's like a golden goose. Why would you kill your golden goose? So it depends on your strategy and your style. Active is definitely more interesting, more exciting. Everybody who makes a lot of fuss on Facebook or social media, hey, look how much money I make. Those are the active traders usually. And the passive guys are typically a little mellow, a little underground because the dividend payment is not a lot. So it's not something to shout about. For me personally, I love to be the dividend investor. I think it just appeals to me a lot. I read this guy's blog. It's called Mr. Free at 33. It's this American guy who bought a lot of dividend stocks in the US and to the point that it pays him about $14,000 a year in dividends alone. So if you divide that by 12, he makes a little over a thousand something dollars a month. So that's nothing in the US. However, he's smart enough to move to Thailand and a thousand dollars over there enables him to live a pretty decent life. In my opinion, this guy kind of hacks the system. So he's, he's really cool. He, I was really inspired by his journey. Okay, so I bought some stocks in Malaysia and I also bought some stocks in the US. All right, so here's what my Malaysia stock app looks like. All the stocks that I buy, they all pay dividends. That's just my personal uh, preference. All right, so if you can see here for Malaysia, I bought Air Asia because I love flying at the time. This is before all this COVID thing, by the way. And then there's Gamuda. Um, I think this is the company that was involved in uh, the MRT construction thing. So it's a pretty big deal. Air Asia's value tank. So that is bringing my market value down. But again, I have no intention to sell this. Uh, so the Malaysia Maybank trading app, it, it looks good. It makes it easy to trade. So if you want to buy a foreign stock, so in my case, US, it's actually actually another platform altogether. It's not using this app. Here's what the web application looks like. It's very old school. It's very complicated. I bought a few companies that I know. AT&T is kind of like Maxis over there. I used to use their service when I studied in, in the US. And then Coca-Cola, who doesn't know Coca-Cola? And there's another small company, Brookfield Property. I think this was a tip that I read online and then I did some research and then, oh, it kind of makes sense. And then uh, the value went up a little bit. So this is an example of my US stock portfolio. And here's an example of all the dividend payment that has accumulated in my US stock account.
So before you buy a stock, you generally want to do some sort of research to it because if you don't do research, you just buy randomly. That's kind of like gambling, you know? So doing research as a beginner can get very overwhelming, especially if you're starting out. If if I had a friend who's, who asked me like, hey, I'm interested in stocks, but how can I start? Uh, researching, number one is start with local companies first. So if you're in Malaysia, look into the local companies first. One is because if you buy them, the fees are a lot cheaper. If you buy the US stocks, every time I, I execute an order, it's like 25 US dollar for one order. 25 times four, that's 100 ringgit-ish. So it's a lot of money. However, for Malaysian stocks, it's, I think it's like around eight ringgit. So I made a blog post about the fees that you need to pay if you invest in stocks, if you're using the Maybank stock trading platform. Link in the description. Okay, so number one, start with local companies. Okay, number two, you can narrow down to companies that you actually like or you have at least heard of them, okay? And you know what they do for money, what do they sell to make the money, okay? And then number three, you can narrow down by companies that pay dividends. Even though you don't wanna buy companies that pay dividends, you can consider to research them because if the stock pays dividends, chances are that that company is relatively financially healthy. Also, you couldn't have the money to pay off dividends, right? So with these three things, it can help you to narrow down a certain company for you to start researching, get used to reading financial reports, looking at the charts and that kind of stuff. So pros of uh, stock investing, uh, liquidity, it's very easy to buy and sell. So it's very liquid, okay? So risk. I would consider it quite high risk. However, if you buy stock that pay dividends, I think it's a little less riskier than stocks that don't pay. That's my opinion, okay? So you can you can make a lot of money from investing in stocks, but on the other side of the coin, you can also lose a lot of money if you're not lucky. So trading fees, if you buy local stocks, it's fairly cheap, around eight ringgit per execution for using Maybank. But if you wanna buy foreign stocks, for example, the US stocks, it's gonna cost you 25 US dollar per transaction at least. So there's a big difference. So if you wanna start you can start with the Malaysian stock market first um, cool factor you look online there's all sorts of traders portray how cool their life is uh, the dividend guys are generally more mellow they don't they don't shout about as much this is just something that I notice okay so stock investing uh, verdict I don't recommend this to absolute beginners just because it requires a lot of uh, research upfront so if you're starting out the research could get overwhelming. But that being said, if, if this is something that you're really interested in, by all means, go ahead and do your research. I have made a, a blog post about the Maybank stock trading fees. Click here to go and read that. Okay, moving on, uh, robo-advisors. So what is a robo-advisor? So it's similar to unit trust ASNB, but better in many ways, in my opinion. So first of all, there's no human fund manager to figure out what to do with their money. Everything's automatic. When you put money into robo-advisors, they invest everybody's money in ETFs, exchange-traded funds. So an example of an ETF is the S&P 500. It's a pool of stocks in a certain category. So because they don't have fund managers, they have less people to pay and which translates to more profit for you, okay? And one of the best pros, in my opinion, is that they have a really nice app that looks really good and it's really easy to understand. So I think this appeals to the younger generation because when they look at their app, they can immediately see what is the value of your portfolio, where did they put the money, and how much are you making or how much are you losing. I think it's very good for beginners, in my opinion. The next point, again, is very easy to either buy more or sell your investment. So it's very liquid uh, all through the comfort of your app. So unlike ASNB, I have to physically go to the bank to get my money out. So I don't have to deal with none of that with uh, robo-advisors. And the last one is you can select which type of portfolio that is right for you. You can select something that is very low risk where they put a lot of your money into gold. Only a small amount of that is in stocks. Or if you're feeling a little more aggressive, you wanna have take more risk, you can choose a more risky profile where a lot of your portfolio will be in two stocks. Okay, so I have tried two of the probably top trending robo-advisors in Malaysia. The first one is Wahid Invest and the second one is Stash Away. They're, they're very similar, but Wahid Invest invests your money into Sharia compliant investment. I mean, that's the, the, the key difference. I made two videos of how I invested equal amount of money into both and let them run. What worked for me, what I personally like better was uh, Wahid Invest, but that's me personally. So if you want to read, I have two blog posts with, with YouTube videos of, of the first couple of weeks when I started investing in both Stashaway and White Invest and then I have another blog and also YouTube video where I put in an eight month update of what happened and why I choose one over the other. Okay so if you're interested to sign up 
can use my code here. All right, so next one, I tried Bitcoin. Okay, so Bitcoin is a one of the world's most popular cryptocurrency. It's a digital currency that is not governed by anybody. So people who invest in Bitcoin usually do so for the following three reasons. So the first one, the guy who invented Bitcoin created in such a way that it's actually a limited digital currency. You actually have to mine it. But once you mine everything, that's it. People equate it to digital gold. There's a finite amount, the demand goes up. So theoretically, just like gold, the value of whoever owns Bitcoin will go up. All right, so the second, reason is security and transparency. All transactions of Bitcoins are recorded on a public ledger called blockchain. So blockchain is transparent because anybody can access it. And number three, mass acceptance. So some people speculate that in the future, Bitcoin will be so popular, it will actually be widely used or probably even replacing our current money. So everybody who invests in Bitcoin, in my opinion, either they're 100% gambling or they would do so for one of the three reasons that I just mentioned. All right, so in 2020, I caved into the social pressure and I bought some myself using the Luno app. I didn't put a lot because it's very risky. I put 400 ringgit and at this point of this video, the value is 883, which is really good. It almost doubled. I do personally feel that the future is quite bright for cryptocurrencies, but I don't recommend to do this for somebody who's absolutely new, unless if you really study Bitcoin and this is what you like to do. But if you insist, you can try putting a little bit of money just like me. I just put in a few hundred and see how it goes. See if you like the process. All right. So if you if you want, you can use the Luno app. Clicking on the link below in the description using this code. All right. So the next one, investing in property. Okay. If I could tell you guys one thing, you young fellas, millennials, Gen Z, forget about property investing. I think the, the prices of Malaysia properties are, have gone up way high that most people can't sell it off in the future for more than what they paid for. Because there's just too many properties at the moment and there, there's not enough people who want to buy or rent. So even if you buy to rent it out as an investment, you'll quickly realize your rental couldn't cover your mortgage and all the taxes and maintenance fee that you have to pay as an owner. Okay, so here's the key takeaway. Forget about property investing. If you ask like older generation, like our parents, maybe they obviously they would say, yeah, invest in property is really good. I made a lot of money. Yeah, because that worked in their days. You know, back in their days, properties are so cheap. Maybe it's a hundred thousand ringgit. It's no big deal. And then now it's like a million, for example. So of course they made a lot of money, but if you want to buy a property now, it's going to be like 800,000, close to 1 million. And I don't think it can go any higher than that because the average wage in Malaysia is quite stagnant. It doesn't go up with the inflation. So not a lot of people can afford that 1 million ringgit house, for example. All right, so I personally think, my opinion, don't buy a property to invest. Buy a property that you actually want to stay in, live in, build a family in. All right, so get a three bedroom apartment or house or whatever somewhere. Studio apartment, maybe not so good. Maybe not, not such a good idea because families don't want to live there. You also can't live there as well. Like I bought a studio apartment right here, although it's really nice in the middle of the city, but now that I'm married and if I want to have kids, I can't live here anymore. I got to find somewhere else. So I, I'm kind of screwed. So you see, I didn't thought this through. Of course, you can make money from property if you're lucky, if you have connections and all that kind of stuff. But for the vast majority, no, you can't. So the key takeaway, it's, it's, it's very hands-on. You have to go there, you have to meet people, you have to fix stuff. There's always stuff that needs fixing. And point number two, there's a property oversupply at the moment in Malaysia. So there's just way too many properties and most of them are expensive. And there's not enough people who can afford to buy or afford to rent them. And point number three, so before this whole COVID thing, a lot of desperate owners resorted to Airbnb in their last Hail Mary attempt to make some money to pay their mortgage. And I was one of those owners. Running an Airbnb was fine in 2015 all the way to 2018. In 2019, there were so many supply of properties in general in KL that a lot of them also tried to rent out Airbnb and they were all driving the prices down. It was terrible, it was tiring. Your property will get damaged after a while. It's just the wear and tear because there's so many people going in and out. This is my personal opinion. Don't bribe property to invest in. It just doesn't work anymore. We The ship has sailed sayonara bye bye just buy a house for you to stay in so i actually made a comprehensive case study of the true cost of property ownership as an owner for a property under construction so the link is in the description
All right, next, I tried running an Airbnb business. So this was a solution for my previous problem. My apartment here is in, in the middle of uh, Kuala Lumpur, so I thought it would be a very strategic place to rent it out to tourists. So it started with one studio, which is this one. I quickly grew to manage 10 studios in total. One studio became my home office. We, that's where we did the laundry and if guests need to, to put their bags for a while, and that's where I live as well. All right, and I rented out the other nine. And business was doing really well from 2014 all the way to 2018. Here's a screenshot of what my calendar looks like at the time. See all these colors, those indicate different studios that I was renting out. And these are my daily schedule of what needs to be done, like which needs to be cleaned first, then who's going out, who's checking in at what time. However, during 2019, everybody was running Airbnb and it was driving the prices down. I started the price was around 180 ringgit a night, 190. Uh, sometimes during holiday season, I can bump it up to 250. But because there's just too many people doing it and they were driving the prices down. So what happens is new people, how they want to attract customers is that they look at the market price. So for example, the market price is 180, they sell it 470. So what I would do, I rent it out for 160. Oh, it's a vicious cycle of everybody just slashing their prices until there's nothing left. At some point, I remembered even a luxury apartment right next to me which is really expensive they were selling their airbnb for like 80 ringgit a night which is ridiculous and at that point i'm like okay there's no way i can compete with this this is just terrible and i decided that i need to close down this business and do something else so i got the security deposit for my last unit in february 2020 which was just right before the first covid lockdown in march so talk about being lucky so if you want to see a comprehensive guide on how i set up my airbnb you can click on the link below Okay, last. So the reason why I started this website is because if I start a new business, whatever it is, I think I'll have the same problem where I don't know how to market that business. And when I don't know how to market that business and there's too many competition, all we have to do is keep on slashing our prices, which I don't want to do. So I'll end up exactly what, what happened to me during the Airbnb business. So I figured rather than having a product or service first and then figuring out how to sell it, I think it would be better if I did it the other way around, which is build an audience first. Once you have an audience that listens to you, that pays attention to you on a specific topic, it's much easier to promote a certain product on that topic because they're already listening to you. But before that, if I didn't have the attention, didn't have the audience, it's, it's almost like I'm talking to nobody, to an empty field. So it's very hard to be heard. So the name of the game is attention. All right, at this point, my website and YouTube channels started to make money. It doesn't make enough money to replace my full-time income yet. So how you can make money from your website blog is you can place ads. So every time people look, see it, click on it, you'll make a small cut of that ad revenue. You can do sponsored content. So some people who like my blog or my writing or my style can say, hey, I'll give you one of this. And in exchange, can you make a review about it? So that's a sponsored content. Affiliate marketing means that you sell other people's products online. So an example of affiliate marketing is when there's another blogger that wants to sell their book, I do a review about their book and recommend people to buy it. If somebody clicks on my link and go buy that, they can tell that, oh, this customer came from me and therefore I get a little bit of that commission. And this whole process is called affiliate marketing. And, and at the end, the best way to make money is to sell your own products. Whatever it is, selling your own ebook, book, whatever product that you're trying to sell ultimately that's the best way for you to make money but you can't do that until you have like a large enough audience so I highly recommend this if you are the creative type running your own website or social media platform because it is the future and it's just personal branding people love to buy from other people okay there you go those are all the stuff that I've tried and if you're starting out I hope this video has been helpful to give you a real-world view of how it is actually to do all this stuff please share what you think in the comment section below all right, bye.